So, um, so wel welcome to the uh, first class of the uh, course, um, GIFT 612, which is called, uh, full title is called uh, Understanding Modern Steel Products. Um, it's a course that uh, combines um, physical metallurgy, processing, technology, so you understand, um, well first of all you, you learn what, uh, st what steel products are, what steel companies uh, produce, uh, you also understand the physical metallurgy that's behind these products. Uh, and you also uh, learn about how these products are made in practice. Um, so at Postec, when you register for a course, you, there's ample time to uh, see if that's really the course that fits your needs. Uh, and whether it's a course that uh, requires um, prerequisites that you have or don't have. Um, so specifically, this course uh, is not an introductory course. So I will, in the course of my lectures, assume that you are familiar with um, physical metallurgy concepts, right? Um, so we, I will not explain, you know, things like how do you use a face diagram, hmm? or I will not explain, go into um, face transformations and kinetics. I will assume that you know these things. I also assume that you know what veinite is, perlite, etc. So we will not uh, go into any physical metallurgy theory. Hmm? I'll assume this, this is uh, known uh, material for you. Hmm? Same with, you know, uh, uh, basic uh, materials behavior such as mechanical properties uh, and so forth. Yeah? So if if you have had no material science uh, training, this may not be the course for you because there are many uh, topics that will, you know, be very unfamiliar to you. Mm -hmm. So this is this is not an introductory course um, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I assume you you know a lot already. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we use a textbook uh, which which. Uh, I wrote, and it's called uh, Fundamentals of Steel Products Physical Metallurgy. Yes. Uh, there is a uh, um, paperback version available from the United States. You can order it online. Uh, and if for your student, um, I think you, the price is about $50. Yes. So, have a look at this. Uh, please don't copy the book. There are some copies around uh, because I've written the book here at, at GIFT. Uh, the paperback copy is the one from, from the um, uh, Association for Iron and Steel Technology. Uh, is, is the one that, you know, is um, uh, error free, hmm? okay? And, um, and this is already the second edition, so it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of extra material. So I, I really advise you to, to, buy, uh, to buy it. And you know, for the future, it will be a useful um, reference book for yourself also. So, and I've, it's, it was written uh, by myself and by uh, Professor Spear at the Colorado School of Mines. And you know, we've been, uh, bef before we were, uh, in academics, we were still uh, professionals, so um, the book is definitely relevant to a, uh, a person um, working in the steel industry or, or using steel products. Okay, um, so 
our weekly uh, class schedule. You already know it, but let's uh, just repeat this. is uh, from 11 to 12, 15 on Monday and on Wednesdays. And I understand room 401 will be the room uh, we will meet. The reason why we do this is because the lectures are being uh, recorded. Hmm? And, uh, and so if you want to listen to the lectures again, uh, for instance, uh, tonight or, or any time, uh, you, will, uh, you will be able to, uh, to listen to this, the lectures again. On uh, I think the uh, via the GIFT website, hmm? right? Um, for the course grading, what I would like to try um, is uh, have many simple quizzes. Yes, instead of having uh, a stressful final exam, uh, and so. We will, we will just have weekly quiz on Wednesday at the start of the class. And the only thing you have to do is look at the uh, course material of the previous uh, lectures, okay? Okay. Um, I'm also aware of the fact that um, you are all, uh, have, you all have uh, backgrounds in science or in technology or engineers or maybe physicists or, um, or chemists. Uh, you're not language experts, so uh, I want to grade you on uh, you know, what you know about the course, not on your English ability. So I will try to make multiple choice tests, so, or tests where you only have to answer yes or no, or just, you know, a few words, so I don't grade you on your English abilities, right? which that's not the point, and if, um, if you are GIFT students, you anyway already get um, English uh, lectures uh, as part of your uh, curriculum. So, uh, so let's go ahead. Uh, I do want to introduce the subject a little bit. So the, the, uh, the first couple of lectures, we will go into some uh, repeating a few concepts that you may know. Hmm? So we're all on the same wavelength. And uh, uh, we'll say a few things about uh, steel products metallurgy. Hmm? So, um, and um, so, we will talk about um, composition, crystal structure, microstructure, and strength of, of steels, and uh, to highlight the relation that there is between microstructure and steel uh, properties. Mm -hmm. And we'll also uh, uh, see how you, uh, what are the general rules to control the microstructure by thermal cycles or thermomechanical cycles. Mm -hmm. And we will then try also uh, in a simple way to, to make the connection between how um, the thermal processing is actually implemented in industrial uh, processing situations and how it's the physical metallurgy that influences or determines what the processing parameters are if you want to obtain specific properties. Hmm? And, um, and, and we'll give a few simple examples uh, from practice uh, to give you some background. But um, before we start, let's um, say a few very general things so you know what, uh, what we're talking about from a materials point of view. So in the materials, uh, you have a very big category of materials that we call metals and alloys, and it's customary to uh, divide this group in the ferrous alloys and the non-ferrous uh, metals and alloys. Mm? And uh, so non-ferrous would be uh, nickel, copper, aluminum, magnesium, titanium alloys would be the main ones. And on the ferrous alloys, we have also two types, 
uh, the steels and what we call the irons or the cast irons. Hmm? And the big difference is uh, the carbon content. Hmm? And the carbon content, carbon content is less than 2%. Um, then we, we're uh, talking about a steel. If it's higher, it's a cast iron. Hmm? So, so in these cast irons, unlike steels, uh, the uh, uh, cast irons uh, contain graphite very often. Hmm? Graphite is basically carbon, yes? Whereas steels, the carbon is present as a carbide, which we call cementite. Why is, where does this 2% come from? Well, it comes from the maximum solubility of carbon in the allotropic form, the austenitic allotropic uh, form of uh, iron, hmm? as you can see in the phase diagram. Um, steels themselves are then subdivided in uh, uh, alloys that um, we, um, on, again, on the basis of the carbon content, uh, divide into the low carbon steels, the medium carbon steels, and the high carbon steels. Hmm? Uh, and uh, in addition to uh, these low alloy steels, we also have high alloy steels. Hmm? Uh, high alloy steels, I would like uh, to point out to you that when we, uh, at this stage, that high alloy steels are usually, uh, is usually a way to refer to stainless steels. Hmm? And uh, they contain, uh, these stainless steels uh, contain at least um, 10 to 12 percent of chromium to make them corrosion resistant. As GIFT offers a course specifically on uh, stainless steels, the subject of stainless steel is not talked about in this course. So the, uh, what we are talking about in the course are the low alloy steels. Uh, the high alloy steels are uh, usually produced industrially in different plants. Yes, They're used uh, very often for many uh, applications that are different from the carbon steel. So they have uh, basically their own um, uh, industry um, uh, and uh, uh, processing methods, not their own processing methods, but own processing routes. So you don't mix uh, really too much the manufacturing of low carbon steels and, and uh, corrosion resistant steels, although that's not 100% uh, correct, and we'll, as, as the course proceeds, we'll, we'll talk about this. Um, but the, the course focus uh, in uh, uh, the course we're dealing uh, now with is uh, low alloy steels. Mm -hmm. okay. You see that um, the typical uh, steels are defined as less than 2% of carbon. The actual uh, carbon contents uh, rarely go higher than 1.4, 1.5% of carbon. Hmm? And, and those uh, carbon levels are considered very high. Hmm? Um, and, uh, what type of applications do we know that contains these extremely high levels of carbon? Well, for instance, a file, when you, uh, you make a file, you know, uh, a file is an instrument you use to um, file down uh, another metal. You know, the, it's a piece of uh, metal with very, very hard uh, 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 pins, pin structure on it, so you can uh, file away on wood or on metal. The, these, um, these will contain these, this typically uh, very high level of carbon. Hmm? And um, the uh, uh, different uh, types of carbon steels are always divided in plain versions, yes, where the most important alloying element is carbon, and then 
alloyed versions. For instance, in the case of the low carbon steels, which are uh, very important, we have a generally uh, a carbon content is less than 0.25 percent. So uh, if you look around you, most of the steels, for instance, um, cars are made of, contain less than 0.2 percent of carbon. Actually, they contain even less than 0.1 percent of carbon. So, uh, well, this class of steels um, is uh, divided in the plain low carbon steels, where basically carbon is the only important alloying element. And then you have what we call the, the high strength low alloy steels, which are alloyed with uh, elements such as niobium, titanium, copper, etc., vanadium, uh, to make them strong. Hmm? Same with the uh, medium carbon steels, 0.25 to 0.6 carbon steels. You have plain medium carbon steels where you all have additions. To the properties are basically achieved by um, uh, carbon. And the uh, versions of these, steel, uh, uh, these steels, which are alloyed with elements which will allow you to uh, perform thermal treatments on them. And we'll, we'll discuss these. Okay. So what we see is that if you go from low carbon steel, medium carbon steel, high carbon steel, what you, uh, what you typically have are materials which display an increasing level of strength and hardness, cost because of the alloying, and also a decreasing ductility. Now, when we talk about um, a steel product, yes, uh, we tend to uh, focus on a, a very narrow uh, picture of the, the product, yeah? and um, typically strength. Uh, in practice, things are much more complex, yeah? and that's why I. Uh, like to use this, this uh, steel design chart um, at this early stage in the course. Um, why? Because when a, uh, a user, a, for instance a car manufacturer, uh, purchases steel, yes, um, they don't specify microstructure or anything like that. They're not interested in the physical metallurgy of your steel, yes? Uh, or how you made the steel. They are interested in performance. They want to know specific, uh, they want to be sure that the material they purchase has specific characteristics. Yeah? For instance, a certain yield strength, a certain tensile strength, a certain ability to deform plastically, hmm? elongation. But there are many other things. Hmm? Uh, and we'll discuss those in more detail as we go. You, you may want to have what's called bake hardening. You may want to have a certain strain hardening value. You may want to have a certain ability to uh, formability properties, which is uh, uh, referred to as the Langford parameter. You may want to have certain uh, hydrogen resistance, uh, resistance against hydrogen cracking properties, uh, hole expansion properties, etc., uh, weldability properties. Hmm? Uh, and each of these, uh, for instance, the weldability is the last parameter here, is called the carbon equivalent. Yes? So if the uh, for instance, the shipbuilder who is plying a steel plate specifies the carbon equivalent, that will be a number, yes? And the steel manufacturer will have to deliver a product which has that performance index, that particular number, yeah. okay? So these indices are, uh, or these performance indices, performance values are related to properties of the material. Hmm? Um, well, there's, there's one thing here that's, for instance, missing. Um, 
uh, when you build a, uh, an electrical motor or a transformer, yes, you use steel, typically uh, uh, what's called an electrical steel, to build this. And so uh, you will specify the magnetic properties, specific magnetic properties. Hmm? But these are the list of these properties here. Uh, strength, formability, toughness, hydrogen-induced, cracking resistance, magnetic properties, etc. There are a very large number of properties uh, uh, that are related to these performance indices. Yeah? And of course, uh, as uh, material scientists, you know that these properties are related somehow to structure. Hmm? Uh, for instance, uh, strength is related to uh, composition of the matrix, the grain size, presence of uh, precipitates, etc. Hmm? And the way you control the structure is during the processing of the material. Yes? And there are many, many steps in the processing of the material. Uh, and not all these steps are uh, uh, critical to specific structure, structural aspects. Uh, but this is one of the things we'll do in the course, is go through the processing of the material so you see um, how the, uh, through processing, we achieve a certain microstructure, giving us the properties which will allow us to deliver product with specific uh, uh, values of a performance index, such as the yield strength. Hmm? Um, good. Right. So, right. so in addition to uh, uh, this uh, chart that I just showed, it's important to know that a product, yes, a product does not only have mechanical properties or microstructural properties, it also has geometrical properties, right? Uh, when a car maker buys a sheet material to make car body, yes, um, they specify dimensions to this uh, product. You know, it's got to be um, 1.2 meters wide. It's got to be 0.76 millimeter thick, yes? And not only that, the product has to, has a shape, has a profile, yes? Um, so, and we'll discuss this also, for instance, you want to have a, a well-specified shape to the product yeah? because, for instance, the shape has a big impact on the behavior of the material when you press form it. Okay? And, um, and, and so there are many, uh, in addition to these geometrical properties, you also have technical properties. Mm? Um, uh, for instance, uh, when you... Uh, a car maker buys steel for a, uh, to make, for instance, an outer panel. Uh, not only uh, does the material have to have uh, guaranteed mechanical properties, it also needs to have guaranteed formability properties, but also weldability properties. You have to be able to coat it, you have to be able to paint it, and the paint appearance it goes down to the level of paint appearance, has to be perfect. So all these uh, elements are a part of the, the, the product profile. Hmm? And, um, uh, and it's achieved or, or uh, in a conditions, in, in a situation that's also equally complex. Hmm? A, a plant, an industrial plant, steel plant does not make steel in a one-step process. You have uh, many 
uh, things that go into the making of a steel product. Of, of obviously, the, the plant, the industrial uh, unit that will make the, but there is also the, the, the knowledge, processing, the raw materials that are being used, mm, the level of automation, yes, and uh, IT infrastructure that's available will all have an impact on the product. Um, in particular, these two last points are very often overlooked, but they, uh, you should know that the steel industry is, is, has an extremely high level of uh, automation. It takes a very small number of people to uh, uh, produce uh, huge quantities of steels every day. Mm -hmm. And um, so, by the way, uh, steel is uh, the material that's uh, produced in the highest quantity, both in volume and in weight, of all other materials. Uh, next material being uh, cement products. Mm -hmm. So it's very widely used and the, uh, the impact of uh, automation and uh, information technology on producing steels is, is very important. Mm -hmm. So let's look at a few examples uh, of uh, use of steel. Uh, in constructions, for instance, reinforcement bars, you have these elements, structural steels, you have here uh, bridge cables. Very often the steel that goes into buildings um, is not obvious. Uh, for instance, this room here uh, looks like a nice room, uh, modern room, there's wood, yes, there is cloth on, uh, so there's not much steel visible actually. Uh, however, uh, that's just the surface. If you go uh, behind these panels, you will see that uh, most of the structure of this, this building is actually steel. Yes? And what you see is just finish. And that's the case for most of the, uh, the buildings that are being put up today. And uh, uh, Right, and other constructional uh, uh, applications, for instance, uh, uh, pre-painted roof tile panels, this roof here, uh, these ventilation ducts. Uh, this building is full of ventilation ducts like this. You don't see them very uh, clearly because they're, they're hidden in the, uh, uh, as I said, be behind uh, uh, decorative panels. Uh, automotive is, uh, and transport sector uses very large amounts of steels uh, for the car bodies, but also for uh, uh, elements of uh, motors, such as crankshafts, valve spring, exhaust systems, uh, transmissions, and also elements uh, related to the suspension of the car, such as the suspension spring, the wheels, of course, uh, of many cars are still made in uh, steel today. Uh, steel uh, plays an essential role in energy and power applications. Um, this should not be a reinforcement bar. This is a, uh, an electrical motor, yes? And uh, transformers are being uh, made out of uh, steel also. And uh, so all our power grid uh, depends on, on critically on steels because of these transformers, yes? Mm -hmm. um, uh, not for the uh, transport of, uh, of power. The reason being that uh, steel has uh, resistivity is too high. For that, you need to use uh, aluminum or copper. Hmm? But it is the resistivity of steel that makes it suitable to make motors and uh, transformer steels. Other applications uh, include uh, uh, oil industry, shipbuilding, hmm? 
for instance, these offshore constructions are entirely made of uh, the structure uh, of uh, steels. Packaging is a, an important application. Uh, office furniture, furniture in general, hmm, uh, is uh, still uh, to a large degree made with steel. Consumer appliances such as microwave over, washing machines, air conditioners are uh, made out of steel. Hmm? In the course of the, the lectures, we'll, we'll, we'll have a attention to automotive applications in particular, uh, because it's an interesting application where you see uh, many different aspects of the use of steel. Uh, uh, contrary to what uh, people think, 99% uh, of the cars are still made out of steel, yes? Uh, and uh, the ones that aren't made out of steel tend to be uh, rather exceptional situations. It turns out that um, uh, as soon as a car maker uh, produces more than th about 300,000 cars a year, Yes, um, the most economic way to, uh, to build the cars is actually with steel. So there is a very big um, incentive to use steel and to continue using steel in the future. Hmm? Okay. So the course, as I said, will be uh, about steel products. Yes, and their performance, how we uh, get these performances, these material properties, yes, via uh, the physical metallurgy, understanding the physical metallurgy, and uh, working it out so that we know how to uh, uh, produce the uh, materials, these materials with uh, specific properties and microstructures. Hmm? Okay. In general, um, of course, uh, there is already a uh, route to make uh, steel products. Hmm? And uh, this route uh, is, um, looks like this. Hmm? And we'll be discussing this in very great detail in the course of uh, in the course of this lecture, these lectures uh, this semester, um, we will uh, say only today we'll say a few things about steel making and casting because that's a, a separate subject. But I'll say a few things about this. Uh, so most of the steel is either made by basic oxygen furnace using uh, uh, as raw material or that comes from a blast furnace or alternative ways of making primary iron. Or you can make steels using electric arc furnace, EFs. Yes? And in that case, your material, base material is, is scrap. Hmm? Most of the steels we produce are continuously cast. Yes? There's some ingot casting left for specific applications, such as, for instance, when you do a, uh, when you uh, manufacture uh, rolls for, for rolling mills, for instance, or uh, big shafts, big industrial shafts uh, uh, for power generation, uh, for instance, you will still do ingot casting. Hmm? These, uh, this continuous casting, uh, results in the production of slabs, blooms, or billets, yes? And slabs usually are processed uh, in the following way. It, they can go into a plate mill to eventually make, uh, for instance, pipes. Hmm? Um, you, the slabs can go into hot rolling to make a wide variety of plate or sheet products. Hmm? The blooms can go into the uh, rolling of beams, yes? And then we make what's, what are called long products, 
beams, sheet piles, sections, things that you're familiar with from seeing construction sites. And then you have the billets are used to make uh, wire rods or bar products. And, and this is an example here of wire products. Yes? Okay. And each of these uh, uh, types of products, uh, tubes, pipes, plates, sheet, beams, and bar and wire go to very specific industries. Okay, so let's start, uh, say just a very uh, quick number of things about uh, the steel making. So by and large, most steel makers produce primary uh, steel from uh, using a blast, uh, using um, uh, what's called pig iron from a blast furnace. Hmm? In the blast furnace, it's a blast furnace is a metallurgical reactor where you top load iron ore, coke, and limestone. These iron ore, you don't actually dump iron ore as such into the blast furnace that would clog the, uh, the blast furnace. It needs to be able to, uh, it needs to be permeable for uh, gases. Uh, so the iron ore is uh, inputted as lumps or pellets or sinter. Hmm? Um, what uh, else do we put in this reactor? Well, uh, basically heat, heated air, hot air hmm? yes, is uh, blown into this reactor via tuyeres. Yeah, this is, these are pipes. Uh, you blast this hot air into the uh, uh, blast furnace. You can also inject some uh, 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 carbon bearing compounds such as coal or uh, plastics if you want. That's being done uh, sometimes. And at the top, uh, by the way, you have alternating layers of coke and iron, basically, and limestone. Hmm? The uh, reactions that happen in the, oh yeah, and what comes out of the um, blast furnace, also important here, is molten iron, yes, and molten slag. Yeah? And uh, molten iron is basically your product, and molten slag is a, um, a, a liquid that contains all the in oxide impurities that are uh, 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 created in the process of uh, making the uh, typical uh, production rates of a blast furnace about 9,000 tons per uh, per day. Mm -hmm. So that's considerable. Um, the uh, uh, reactions in the uh, uh, blast furnace are the, first of all, generation of heat by the uh, oxidation of uh, carbon from the coke to CO2, and then the reduction of the oxide to metal. Hmm? So the carbon CO2 reacts with the coke to form CO, and then this CO can reduce uh, iron oxide to iron, uh, and the carbon can also reduce uh, this, um, um, the oxides in stepwise fashion to iron, to pure iron. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's because of the high temperature, this is liquid uh, metal. Mm -hmm. By the way, these reactions are endothermic, so it's important to have heat generation. The other very important thing that happens is purification. Hmm? And that's why we need the limestone in this uh, blast furnace, because the limestone, uh, which is calcium carbonate, will create calcium oxide, which will uh, uh, form together with the impurities SiO2 and Al2O3, yes, will form slag, yes, this liquid slag. By the way, um, the, uh, where does the ore come from? Hmm? 
uh, originally, that's always interesting to know where iron comes from. You know, it's one of the most, uh, because of its, its uh, nuclear stability, it's, it's one of the uh, most important uh, elements a, uh, in nature. Hmm? It's also interesting to know where the, the, the uh, iron ores come from. Hmm? So um, the, uh, the rich deposits were actually formed uh, quite a long time ago. Hmm? Um, and originally, uh, before there was any uh, photosynthesis, and um, uh, on Earth, the oceans contained a, a lot of dissolved iron and uh, no dissolved oxygen because you didn't have oxygen in those days. Hmm? But when um, organisms developed that were capable of photosynthesis, hmm? uh, of course they would uh, pick up CO2 and form oxygen. Hmm? And uh, this oxygen um, combined with the dissolved iron and uh, formed uh, hematite or magnetite with uh, much lower uh, solubility. And so you'd form uh, deposits of these uh, oxides at, on the, uh, on the uh, seafloor. Hmm? And uh, this ended forming these uh, banded iron formation, BIFs. Yeah? And um, where you have uh, iron oxides alternating with silicates, yes? And uh, the, the, so the very rich uh, iron ores look like this. Yeah? And that's why in the blast furnace, uh, you need to uh, reduce the oxygen, uh, reduce, excuse me, reduce the uh, iron oxide, yes? And then also take out the silicates. Yes, which, which are originally in the, in the ore. And so one, one will go to the uh, slag, the other one will go to the liquid metal. By the way, uh, 9,000 tons uh, of steel a day means that you're producing about uh, 2 million, 2.5 million tons uh, of metal uh, per year. And so that means that if you, uh, if you are a big integrated producer of steel, such as uh, POSCO, uh, and, and, uh, and, and on the side here of um, uh, Pohang, if, you want, if you're producing about 15 million tons of steel per year, that means that uh, you, know, you will need uh, you know, uh, quite a few blast furnaces or five, five or six blast furnaces uh, to produce your, your steel. Hmm? Okay. Now this, uh, the material that comes out of your blast furnace has very high carbon levels. Yes. So the, uh, in other words, the carbon we were talking about uh, earlier is a natural alloying element in steel. Okay. And the first thing you do when you make steel is actually remove carbon, okay? Remove carbon. The steel, the, excuse me, the, the iron that comes out of the uh, blast furnace is first uh, desulfurized. And during the converter process, we decarburize and dephosphorize the, uh, the um, uh, iron. Mm? So what, what you, um, uh, this is a converter here, this part here, not, not, not this, this is just a uh, loading uh, scrap metal, I think, in the, uh, in the converter here, but if this is a converter here, this is a cross section. What we do in this so-called basic oxygen furnace, the, uh, well, the name refers to what we're doing, uh, first of all, basic is because we have a, uh, the lining of the uh, uh, of the of, the, of this uh, thing contains uh, is basic is alkaline uh, uh, material, alkaline uh, stones. Yes, no no silicates. Um, and um, 
the oxygen refers to the fact that we are uh, getting rid of the carbon and producing heat by basically blowing oxygen, injecting oxygen on top of the uh, molten uh, metal. Hmm? And we also bubble argon through the uh, through little uh, openings in the bottom of this converter. Hmm? These converters are very large, uh, 150 to uh, 350 tons, hmm? their range. Um, uh, the typical size, this is the, the range that you, you find in the industry, but the typical size are 250, 275. That's a typical uh, modern converter. Um, uh, the uh, conversion, the time it takes to produce uh, this amount of steel is 20 to 25 minutes. So every 20 to 25 minutes you produce, a, a converter can produce um, about 250 tons of steel. Um, yes, you have oxygen top blowing. At the bottom you inject argon, sometimes mixed with uh, oxygen. And there is n there, you don't do alloying additions. Yeah? So the, the, the converter is just basically a reactor where you get rid of the carbon, yes? And um, the original carbon is about 3.4 to 4.5% and is reduced uh, by a factor of about 100 yeah? to uh, 0.01. 0.05 percent. Uh, in this course, um, we usually, when I refer to percent in compositions, uh, I mean weight or mass percents, hmm? not uh, molecular or at atom percents, uh, which which some uh, people in physical metallurgy will use. Hmm? Okay, so let's have a, a small detail a view of you know, what you put in, what you put out of a converter. Well, what comes in is a pig iron hmm, at a temperature of uh, 1450 degrees. Yeah? What comes out is a, a steel and slag yeah? uh, because as you uh, blow in uh, your oxygen, you will also oxidize not only the, the carbon, hmm, but that goes away as a gas. Yeah? You also oxidize the silicon that's in your uh, metal, hmm, so from point A to point O1. The manganese is reduced, the sulfur is reduced, and the phosphorus is reduced. And in addition, uh, we're left with about 40 ppm of nitrogen. No or extremely low hydrogen levels and no residuals. Residuals are typical, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come uh, to that in a moment, but are typical elements such as copper, nickel, chrome, antimony, etc., which are also um, um, elements that come basically out of the ore uh, that you use. Hmm? And the temperature is very high, 1700 degrees C. That's the result of the combustion heat of the, the carbon, basically. Hmm? The slag that comes out, uh, the slag is again formed mainly by adding lime, which is calcium carbonate, to the uh, converter. Hmm? It contains uh, so it still contains a lot of uh, calcium carbonate. It will contain FeO, SiO2, manganese oxide, magnesium oxide, Al2O3, and phosphorus. Yeah. Okay. But is this, uh, before I continue, just one step back, perhaps. Okay. There are two elements that... Uh, in uh, steel technology, we don't really like very much because they have 
a pronounced negative impact on, in particular, the mechanical properties of steel. Um, those are sulfur and phosphorus. Mm -hmm. um, because in many, uh, but we'll see, you, um, we'll see that it's not always the case, but um, in general, in, during steel making, you want to achieve very low levels of these two elements, okay? The sulfur is removed before the uh, converter, yes, by uh, a so-called calcium carbide treatment, yes? The calcium in this calcium carbide basically binds the sulfur and forms uh, calcium uh, sulfide. Mm -hmm. And the phosphor removal that is done in, the, uh, in this converter by having a high basicity, a, a lime-rich uh, slag. The alternative to uh, making steel via a blast furnace is to make it via an uh, uh, electric arc furnace. Hmm? And uh, so an electric arc furnace looks like this, yes? Hmm? And uh, here you work with recycled material. Yeah? Um, the recycling rate of steel is very, very large. Very large. Hmm? Uh, in the 90s, 90%. Yes? Um, it's so large that uh, it is projected that in the future, some uh, societies will not need to make any new steel. They will just recycle their old steels. They will not need to import uh, steel uh, because their needs will be covered by the recycling of steel. Yeah? Okay, so um, recycling is uh, very, very uh, developed for steel. And so, and, and also it, it allows a parallel route for steel, pro uh, manufacturing of steel products uh, via the electric arc furnace. The other impact of electric arc furnace uh, is that the environmental impact is minimal. Once you start recycling steel, yes, the amount of CO and CO2 you make is minimal because uh, the steel you have, yes, it's already steel. There's no need to make CO2 during the reduction, yes, and there's no need to make, uh, uh, yes, during the reduction in the blast furnace, and there's no need to make CO2 uh, in the converter, right? So the amounts of CO2 you produce are very minimal, yeah? So, and, and that's an important aspect uh, because um, it, in terms of CO2 production, steel, uh, the production of iron, uh, for every ton of steel you produce, you need to uh, make more than two tons of CO2, right? So it's a considerable amount of CO2 that, we, that is made during the production of iron. Hmm? Okay, so in this uh, furnace here, we, uh, we melt scrap metal, ferro alloys, and other additions, basically slag forming additions. And of course, uh, you need to make some uh, adjustments to the composition, and you do that in a uh, oxygen furnace, again, where uh, you will adjust the carbon content in your molten metal by uh, uh, using getting rid of it with oxygen. Uh, so if we look inside a, a electric arc furnace, um, we see again slag, which is very often called a, a foaming slag, I won't go into the details here, and uh, floating on the steel, and the steel is tapped via this eccentric uh, bottom tapping. Diameter of these things are four to eight meters, the weights, the heat weights are about, they vary between 50 and 150 tons. Typical value is 125 tons. 
And of course you need to have electric power installed. Usually these are, uh, we use alternating current um, uh, electric arc furnaces. In addition, there are some burners uh, to keep the metal warm on the uh, top side away from the electrodes. And you can produce about, uh, a typical electric arc furnace can do 30 heats per day and about uh, a total production of 3,600 uh, tons per day. Hmm? Tap to tap time is 50 minutes. So um, it's a route where the production rate is slightly lower than the, uh, the production rate uh, blast furnace converter. Hmm? You can see here in particular the, the, the heats that you produce uh, uh, are smaller and the, the tap to tap times are about twice the, uh, the tap to tap time of a converter. Hmm? So typically um, we have uh, we input scrap metal or scrap replacements. We uh, put in lime and dolomite. Uh, dolomite is uh, similar to lime. It's a, a carbonate, but it contains magnesium oxide uh, in addition to calcium oxide to form the slag. You uh, get this slag to foam by uh, injecting oxygen and carbon in it, yes? And um, you also, the, the carbon in, these, um, in this steel uh, comes from the fact that you use uh, graphite electrodes. And so that they, and they get used up as you, as you work. And so that uh, is one of the reasons why you, you do increase the carbon content in the steel. Yeah? So what, what are typical things you get in? Well, you will uh, uh, melt about a ton of uh, scrap, yes? Uh, and, and these are the other values. The next biggest thing is uh, about um, 50 kilos of lime to, uh, to make uh, the slag. Yeah? And what comes out hmm, is for every ton of steel, you get about 100 to 200 kilos of slag and about 200 kilograms of, of gas. Yeah. Um, the um, uh, amount of uh, the, the types of things uh, that, are, that can be used as a source for uh, iron that you can put in a uh, electric arc furnace is very uh, broad. Hmm? So the scrap, yes, uh, is basically recycled iron, yes, um, can take the form, very different forms, yes, uh, depending on where it comes from, yes, and the different qualities of, um, so for instance, um, uh, when we talk about shred, that usually refers to car. Uh, car bodies that are recycled. They uh, usually consider very high quality uh, scrap. Uh, they contain very low levels of carbon, yeah? uh, uh, carbon, cro um, copper, yes. You have uh, bushing. Bushing is when you produce, for instance, cars or you produce uh, um, washing machines and you do press forming, there's always a little bit of steel that during the production of these things gets discarded, gets cut off and uh, set aside for recycling. That's called bushing. Hmm? Sheet and trim from stamping. Hmm? You have plate, structural um, old buildings that are being torn down, etc. cetera. Uh, bundles, hot bricketed iron can also be used. That's a mixture of uh, 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 basically a brick that's made of ore, iron ore and carbon. You can have reduced, pre-reduced pellets. These are, again, uh, ore pellets that have been pre-reduced. Uh, uh, DRI, direct reduced iron. Hmm? 
those are uh, uh, and pig iron you can also you know uh, some people are uh, can use uh, what basically comes out of a blast furnace in a uh, electric arc furnace hmm? and um, then um, one of the things that is always a big concern with electric arc furnace uh, steels is the, uh, the quality of the steel and in particular what we call the residuals. Yes? Uh, elements such as copper, nickel, chrome, moly and tin. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, they will impact your uh, steel properties negatively yes? and so um, because of that they um, will for instance if you are producing uh, automotive quality steels yes mm -hmm. you want to have very very low levels of these residuals mm -hmm. uh, so you uh, um, the costs go up yes because you need to have pre-selected uh, pre-selected uh, scrap wire rod is a little bit less demanding uh, special uh, bar quality less demanding merchant bar rebar rebar are reinforcing bars for uh, that are used in conjunction with cement to make uh, concrete uh, half a percent max so one of the reasons is that um, when you have uh, high uh, copper contents the in particular the copper content is that the, um, the the copper does not dissolve in liquid in uh, in steel right so it will tend to uh, form uh, at high temperature a molten a layer of molten copper a film of molten copper at grain boundaries yes and as soon as you cast this material yes, uh, at high temperatures, it solidifies and then and you bend it, because it has a copper film at the grain boundaries, it breaks open the, the, uh, the slabs uh, that you're producing. Yes? And so that's a very big technical problem, the, the, this cracking, and it's called uh, hot shortness, hmm? copper hot shortness. You can't see it. It's behind this, this this thing here. Oh, yeah, I'm, uh, let, yeah. hot shortness. Yeah. Uh, so you want to avoid this. Hmm? There we go. Hmm? Right. So. Let's go back to our uh, basic oxygen uh, steel making. So we uh, have the process, the pretreatment of hot metal, the converter, and the end result is that we have material with very low phosphorus, 0 0.008, very low sulfur, 0 0.006, copper, uh, carbon, 0.01, Yes, 0 0.002 and 0 0.002 nitrogen after the uh, basic oxygen furnace. Right. So these very low levels of carbon, yes, of uh, sulfur, of phosphorus, yes, uh, we're uh, quite happy with that. Uh, but we need to adjust the compositions. Yes, we need to adjust the compositions. So that is being done in the so secondary metallurgy. Hmm? So in the secondary metallurgy, you have you basically have the, the steel that comes out of your converter, and it's in a ladle. It's basically a big pot with uh, uh, refractory lining, and there you're going to do the adjustments. Um, first of all, you'll do adjustments which are related to the uh, basic oxygen furnace. In the basic oxygen furnace, 
you blew uh, uh, oxygen on your steel, so you want to make sure you get rid of all the CO you, have, you still have in your steel and the excess oxygen you have in your steel. Um, and then you want to adjust the composition. 0.01% of carbon is very low. Maybe you need 0.1% of carbon. So you need to adjust this composition. All right. So let's have a look. Uh, the secondary metallurgy is very important because that's basically the moment where you set the composition of your steel. After that, you really can't change it anymore. Okay? So this is essential, very important. Okay? Um, and and uh, uh, of course, when you uh, inject oxygen in on your metal, you can expect that some elements which are uh, which form very stable oxides, will form oxides. So you also need to get rid of those. Uh, those oxides are called inclusions, and you need to get rid of those. Yeah? So, so you need to have slag, slag producing uh, compounds ox uh, with high basicity. And that means that you need to have calcium oxide, uh, mag uh, magnesium oxide, uh, to form the slag, so you will add uh, limestone and dolomite. Hmm? Then you need to add alloying elements, such as in typically uh, manganese, silicon, chrome, moly, nickel are typical elements you would want to alloy, or micro-alloying additions, such as niobium, titanium, vanadium, and boron, yes. And uh, usually these are added not as pure elements. So you don't add manganese as uh, pure manganese. You usually add them as ferroalloys. So alloys of iron and manganese or iron and chromium, yes? Uh, the reason is it costs much less to uh, add a, a chromium rich, very, very high chromium uh, iron alloy than to add pure chromium, okay? Um, you also add calcium. Calcium is added to, uh, to uh, uh, influence the uh, shape of the inclusion, of the oxide inclusions that you are not able to extract from the um, um, molten bath. Of course you need to adjust the temperature. The reason is because uh, you will, after this you will need to cast your metal, yes, and you want to be able to, you want to be casting at the right temperature. You can still, uh, if needed, continue removing carbon and nitrogen. Usually that's done by degassing. You also do a lot of stirring in the la uh, ladle. You do stirring to allow removal of the inclusions by increasing the contact time between the metal and the slag. And finally, you also do uh, aluminum killing. The, after the uh, uh, BOF furnace, the uh, steel contains a high level of oxygen, yes? Um, so you get rid of it by means of aluminum. Aluminum forms extremely stable oxide, uh, Al2O3, yes? And uh, that basically takes care of any oxygen, uh, residual oxygen there may be in the steel. Why is that so important to get rid of this residual oxy oxygen? Why couldn't we live with having oxygen in solution? Yeah? Well, the reason is that when you uh, cast the steel, yes, and say you hadn't added aluminum, you didn't add aluminum, you didn't form Al2O3 with the residual uh, oxygen, yes, then as the material would slowly solidify, the uh, solubility of CO 
yes, oxygen and carbon. Remember, I, I want carbon in my steel. In certain cases, I will add carbon in my steel, yes. The, the solubility will decrease and the CO will start forming bubbles, yes. And if you don't do the aluminum addition, the, the solidifying metal will suddenly start to foam and bubble, yes. And you will not be able to cast anything, yes? Actually, you may act have an extremely dangerous situation, yes? With the material overflowing, yes? So you cannot cast anything uh, that, that, contains, uh, that contains oxygen, yes? High levels of oxygen that they come. Uh, and that's why the word, we, we don't, in general, in the, the steel industry, you don't talk about uh, aluminum addition, you add, we say aluminum killing. And the killing, the, the killing refers to making sure that there is no, uh, that the casting is, uh, is not effervescent. Effervescent means bubbling, yeah? Yeah, okay. So if you look at the top of this uh, ladle here during the uh, secondary metallurgy, you will see uh, electrodes to keep it the metal warm. You will see uh, uh, here. You see this this uh, tube here. That's that's how you throw in your uh, ferro alloys. There'll be sensors for the temperature to measure the hydrogen level. Mm -hmm. um, certain uh, elements, certain uh, additions, in particular the aluminum, is added with a, a wire. Yes, so you have wire feeds, yes. And of course, remember, as I said, this is the time where you will make your alloy, yes. Uh, you will, of course, uh, sample, have sample the molten metal before you go and cast it. There are certain situations uh, where you want to have very, very low levels of carbon. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one of the reasons uh, may be because you want a material with extremely high formability, yes? yes. And it turns out that, uh, that in order to achieve this, you need to have very low carbon and nitrogen levels. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is done by a addition to the ladle treatment, yes, yeah. you, um, and it's called vacuum metallurgy. The reason is that you uh, continue removing the uh, uh, carbon, getting very low levels of carbon, in the following way. Um, you have a, uh, you put on, in, so this is the, your, your ladle, right? Uh, the one we just saw, the molten metal. You put in this uh, uh, vacuum tank, yeah? and this vacuum tank has two uh, tubes at the bottom. Yeah? And in one, one of the uh, tubes, you inject uh, argon. Yes, this leg, you inject argon. Yeah? Yes, so, so and. Uh, so this tube is called a snorkel tube, the snorkel tube. So what happens if you inject argon? The, uh, the density of that, the density here of the metal here is lower, yes? So what happens if I have two tubes here? One has low density, one has high density. So this metal will move up. It will move up into this vacuum tank, yes? It will bubble up. Yeah, and you will, so the, um, and, and the material will overflow, go back here, yes, and, and, and this uh, pipe will actually pump the iron around. That's how you work. And, um, and when the metal is here, it's in a low uh, in a vacuum, basically, yes, and in this vacuum, right, the, uh, yeah, the uh, uh, CO yeah, that is still in solution reacts with some of the oxygen we inject 
to form CO2. Okay? And because of the low, uh, of, uh, the low pressure system, we can have, we can reduce, continue reducing the carbon. In this system, we also do alloying additions. And um, most of the degassers, we call this degassing. Actually, uh, the reason is because you remove the carbon, um, so the, the carbon in solution and the oxygen in solution as CO, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, you call it a degasser. The, we call it RH degassers. RH stands for Rostal Hereus, uh, the inventors, inventing companies of this process. It's universally used, yes? yes. And there, you, there is an alternative which, does, which costs less but is not as effective as the tank degasser. Carbon levels can uh, be reduced to 0.001%, another 10-fold uh, 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 less than what we have, and nitrogen level 0 0.02. Okay, so this is a good moment to stop uh, our first uh, lecture. Okay, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'll see you Monday for continuation.